all see the grandeur. The immense space. And the bite of nature. Also see the challenge. This is what they live for. And with every powered stride, they'll carry a vision of the way it used to be and is today in the 1,151-mile Alaskan journey known as the Iditarod. Off the Cook Inlet, it is a sunny March 6th in Anchorage, Alaska. And thousands gather for the ceremonial start of the 27th edition of the Iditarod Sled Dog Race. More than 1,000 dogs and 63 teams are barking to get busy. The guy was honorary musher, eh? People here are from every walk of life, and some have even bid their way onto a sled to experience the first 20 miles. Most know the favorites, like Jeff King, who returns to defend the title he won the year before, or Doug Swingley, who wants to win as he did in 95. Then there are others who have no real chance. This man, Sonny King from South Carolina, of all places, shows the race is expanding its borders. And yet, in spite of all the nationalities and states represented, the atmosphere here is decidedly and unmistakably Alaska. The Iditarod goes from Anchorage to Nome on the state's western coast, and its course is made up of 25 segments or checkpoints, and the fastest time wins, but the clock remains ticking even when you rest. The spirited first day is followed by the race beginning in earnest on the second. The trail heads northwest toward the Alaskan Range, eventually bringing you to Rainy Pass, where it won't be raining. Next stop, the Indian village of Nikolai. After that, to Kotna, where most mushers make their 24-hour stop. Then it's through the ghost town of Iditarod, onto the frozen Yukon River, which is where you'll get the skin-numbing winds in the face. All the way through Old Woman Pass, onto the Eskimo village of Unalakleet, which is the gateway to the barren coast of the Bering Sea. After that, it's on to Nome, which has the richest of traditions when it comes to mushing. Nome is where it is for one simple reason, gold. It was discovered here in 1898. Then there were rugged encampments and soon the rush was on to come to the great frontier, find your fortune. The area grew rapidly and so did the need for supplies and the need to move them. There were trails that cut through the wilderness and horses worked out sometimes for that. Ships from Vancouver or San Francisco were the other alternative for even larger equipment. And all these things worked out fine until winter hit. The white invaders had the right idea all the time right under their noses. The sleds and the dogs that the Eskimo natives had been using for centuries. They moved the mail, the supplies, and maybe even the gold. In fact, in 1916, in one day, the dogs of Nome hauled 3,400 pounds of gold. They were, in fact, worth their weight. The legend of mushing reached its zenith in 1925. There was a diphtheria epidemic in Nome, and children were sick. The only planes were in Fairbanks and had been dismantled for the winter. The serum was in Anchorage. The disease was in Nome. The weather was bad and the dog saved the day. Gunnar Kossen was the anchor, 
of 20 drivers who formed a chain that moved over 674 miles from Nanana to Nome. The story played out around the world, and eventually the serum saved the kids. The hospital staff proudly posed with their recovered patients. Gunnar Kossin was a hero, and the ride of his lead dog, Balto, became books, a movie, and a statue in New York Central Park. That's him in black on the left. At this time, we'd like to draw a Lucky Musher's name for the Outfitter Award. Okay, and the winner is Christopher Knott. There are times when dog mushing and the Iditarod look placid and simple, with a golden sun turning things into a portrait of the sport. But beyond every turn is a potential crack in the ice. There are those times when the Iditarod goes wrong, and your body may break, your spirit wilts, and your blood goes cold. To put it in perspective, it's 1,151 miles. That's like taking your sled from New York to Miami without the mountains and the ice and the glaciers in your way. Talking to Dee Dee John Rowe is one woman who knows the joy of winning four times in her life, Susan Butcher. Our expert analyst drove some of the men crazy winning three in a row starting in 1986. Dee Dee John Rowe's best finish for all of her 17 times trying is second. You've got Commander and Job back as your main leaders this year. Same two leaders that you used last year. In a sense, Jeff got you right at the end because one of his leaders did better than yours. Do you have something to add to support these boys? Yeah, one of the, probably the major support that will be in there on the coast is a big black dog named Trotter. And uh, that was Andy Willis's leader last year with my yearling team. He did an excellent job, four-year-old dog, been to Nome twice, and last year, primary leader in the team. Everyone tries to catch a glimpse of those the race has made famous. Jeff King is a three-time winner and defending champion. Even after three I did a rod wins, there are challenges. I mean, if, if it was statistics that were motivating me, and I don't know that it is. Susan's one of four and Rick's one of five and I want to win it the most or something like that, but I don't think that's it. Fact is, I still enjoy what I'm doing. Some watch and get the bug. Sonny King is a 52-year-old veterinarian from Spartanburg, South Carolina. For a time, he was a volunteer vet for the Iditarod. In 95, he was told to get on board. Bruce Lee in 95, sitting in, the, in, in Nome there, we were talking about how much I learned each year from the mushrooms. Bruce, Bruce looked at me and he said, if you want to take a quantum leap in your knowledge, you spend some quality time on the runners. And that thought stuck in my brain. I couldn't get rid of it. I'm very good at taking care of my team, but as but as a musher, I'm I'm, I'm an amateur competing with the likes of Martin Boozer, Rick Swenson, Jeff King, Doug Swingley, Dee Dee John Rowe, who are all professionals. <laughs> Dan Dent is someone worth following. In Baltimore, Maryland, he's an investment counselor, and with stuffed huskies in his office, he frequently crunches the numbers and also finds a way to combine everything with the local police athletic league. The Iditarod Trail has a long tradition of helping children in need. We're having an essay contest with the kids in the police athletic league, and the winner wins a trip to Alaska and will become my Iditarod in my sled during the ceremonial start of the race uh, in Anchorage. These Idita riders are a major feature of the start. Many of these spots are used at auction to raise money and go for as much as $5,000. Some to people who arrive in private jets and carry a high profile, like soap opera veteran Susan Lucci. Some people hear about the Iditarod as a rumor or in a magazine 
and then it becomes part of their lives as well. The first time that we read about it was in the New York Times, in the travel section, and my husband had a section of fun things to do over the weekend. So my husband said, let's go. So we did. We both applied, and he rode, and I rode, and we had a wonderful time, and we fell in love with it the activities, the people, and so we decided to come back again. And we liked it so well, we came back again, and again, and again. And so, the 1999 Iditarod begins with well-known smiles. Yeah. It's, uh, it's absolutely great. It's great. The grand prize winners, on their way, known to be the Anchorage, Alaska, D'Antoine West. Yeah, I'm playing tennis baseball. I'm, I'm thinking that this is going to be fun. Most definitely. Two position, Burn Halter of Willow. Has five top ten finishes. It certainly is an American cultural phenomenon. And the father of all this is Joe Reddington Sr. In the late 60s, a woman named Dorothy Page held some historically motivated sled dog races. The idea of holding an event every year was presented to Joe Reddington Sr. And in 1973, overcoming many financial difficulties, the first Iditarod sled dog race to Nome was held. You see, Joe saw the snowmobile replacing the dogs and thus chasing away a huge part of what had been life in Alaska. He wanted to keep the dogs around, and he has. In 1973, the first Iditarod was won by Dick Wilmarth with his lead dog, Hotfoot. It took him 20 days. Now it's less than half that. Progress. There is great Alaskan pride in what the Iditarod represents, and in the early years, the native Alaskans won plenty, like Emmett Peters in 1975. Three years later, with the race continuing to grow, Dick Mackey and an up-and-comer, Rick Swenson, held a classic duel. Yeah, Swenson, the team is up almost... Swenson recovered from his one-second loss and has five Iditarod wins, spanning three decades. He's won more than anybody. In 1983, Rick Mackey, son of Dick, won his own Iditarod. And then the boys got a little ribbing in 1985 when Libby Riddles broke the gender barrier and became the first woman Iditarod winner. It started a trend. Susan Butcher's three straight allowed women to rule the 80s. They were as tough when the winds did bite and as smart when they needed to be. Joe Reddington was thrilled at how far his dream had come, but the men needed a hero. And to stop the women, Joe Runyon was the man. This year, the race is loaded. Martin Boozer searches for a fourth Iditarod crown. In 1995, when Doug Swingley came from Montana and won as an outsider, they said, how dare he? And also joining the fray is the man defending his championship, Jeff King. This year, the race, because of cancer, does not include Joe Reddington Sr., but he's battling and has vowed to return next year at 84 for the millennium edition of his big creation. In Anchorage, the talk gets serious as the favorites in the 27th running of the Iditarod assess their teams. For Martin Boozer, he apparently feels he has everything he didn't have last year. Just got the, the captain of the one who won I feel real good this year. I, I knew I had a weakened team last year. Um, this year, I feel really strong about my, my solid team. Yes, the team, the athletes, the dogs, they are everything in winning. And Doug Swingley knows it. So you seem really relaxed. Usually a relaxed Doug is kind of dangerous out there on the trail. This is a phenomenal dog team. I'm just going to have a, a lot of fun driving. He's going to be the only Rick Swenson's been in 21 Iditarods, and there's no lack of self-confidence. Uh, the competitors are more serious. I mean, they've got a different... You have less outdoorsmen running the Iditarod today and more more uh, racing specialists. You know, I mean, of the... If, you, if I look down the list of my competitors, there's very few of those guys I'd want to go out on a camping expedition with and think that I, my life was depending on them. They're really good dog men. They, you know, they're really technical people. They can sit down and figure out all these uh, time schedules and nutritional intakes, you know, calorie intakes and, and uh, training regimens and stuff, but going out and starting a fire, ain't necessarily in the book. 
From Manchester, England, there's the perspective of Max Hall. Well, to me, there are three races going on here. There's one race that's a serious competition to win the pot of gold at the end of the run, which is probably realistically between half a dozen mushers. And then there's a second race to me going on probably between the wannabes who are trying to get into that elite group of top mushers who realistically can be expected to win. And then there are probably, I don't know, 25 of them in that group that I think of. And then there's what I think of as the rest of us, which probably includes most of the foreigners, um, which really just are racing to do some sort of private mental arrangement and just finish the race. And don't ask me why. <laughs> Charlie Bowling is an ex-oil rigger who adds some respected eccentricity to the race, while Mike Williams, Russell Lane, John Baker, and Joe Garney proudly represent all native Alaskans. Then there's Harold Thunheim, an experienced Norwegian musher who's in the Iditarod for the first time. Dan Dent and DeAntoine leave Anchorage and will happily be together for 20 miles. Then, Dan will be on his own. As the mushers leave Anchorage, they all know what lies ahead. The ups and downs in the mountains of the Alaska Range. The Happy River switchbacks. Rainy Pass. And Dalzell Gorge. The weather is good for day two and what is called the restart of the Iditarod. Place finishes in 1992. The big players have their game faces on. They live their lives around this race. And the more than $100,000 that's available tends to make them even more serious. A bit more focused this time of year. Uh, what a difference a day makes. You know, yesterday we were all relaxed and joking around and not really all that focused quite yet but right now all we're really thinking about is getting out on the trail and once we're out there let's just get it on. Kurt Alter on his way to the in the 1999 Iditarod they are about to get it on. It is 14 miles from Wasilla to Kanik, population 272. From there it's the beginning of wilderness. Checkpoint 5 is the actual home of the Gabazak family while Joe and Delia's log house is checkpoint 6 and also the post office for the 90 people who live in Squintna. There are embraces for luck, and one team at a time, they begin the Iditarod for real. Sven Engholm of Norway waits his turn, one of five who don't live in North America. After the start, the mushers meet the spirit of the Iditarod, people who use snowmobiles to go out into the woods and make believe they have tailgates. Compared to being froze like a oh, yeah. dick. <laughs> This is our sixth year being here and we have what 250 some flamingos with us growing every year and uh, we have a good time. And where would the Iditarod be without pink flamingos? Sonny King, the South Carolina veterinarian, gets the official send-off. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Sonny King, bib number 27. Meanwhile, Dan Dent and DeAntoine had a little adventure getting out of Anchorage. We uh, went up the Muffin checkpoint there and uh, slid off the uh, side of the trail. And uh, D'Antoine uh, did a little roll, but he said he wanted to look uh, in the eye of danger, so I uh, accommodated him. 
Dan Dent is safely away, and DeAntoine has a taste of what he's in for. Down the field Most of the teams have the maximum 16 dogs at the start, like the second Norwegian, a rookie, Harold Thunheim, leaving civilization, heading out to the Pink Flamingos. Two former winners are cutting through the woods faster than anyone else, believing that there is no time too early to make a statement of where you want to be in the Iditarod. For Doug Swingley, the Montanan, and Swiss-born Martin Boozer, that is to be in front as they keep an eye on each other. Jonro of Willow, Alaska has her energetic team wearing booties for protection. They are thrilled to finally be going and have her near the front while defending champion Jeff King is functioning equally well. He, like all the others, are constantly checking the dogs. How are they running, getting along, cooperating, listening? They are in every way a team. Every musher plays the game differently. What type of dogs, thin hair, thick hair, how to train them, where to train them, how to feed them, when to rest them. Jeff King has called time out in the heat of the day at minus 10 degrees. These are important times to check out the competition. Dan Dent is competition to no one except himself. Here in the early miles, he's doing fine. The Iditarod's day one sun setting. Who will it be? to make the first big play. The first bright headlight to arrive in Squentna was that of John Barron. Raising sled dogs is his life, and he's been at this since 1979. The key at any checkpoint is not who's first to arrive, though, but who is first to leave, and the condition of your dogs. At the checkpoints, every musher's sled is checked for his safety and that of the dogs. You notice quickly that all the dogs in the Iditarod do not look the same, nor behave the same. For more on that, here's Susan Butcher. These dogs are known as Alaskan Huskies. They've been used for over 5,000 years by the Eskimos and Indians to pull sleds and also for playmates for the children. They are a very loving and loyal dog. They are bred for speed, endurance, good coat, and tough feet. They are not a show dog like the Siberian Husky or Alaskan Malamute and are unregistered despite having known lineage. In the early 1900s, gold miners bred huskies with setters, retrievers, wolves, and many others. Often the miners thought the bigger dogs were better. But the best dogs were fast and lightweight, averaging 50 pounds, and still existed in the villages, particularly those along the Yukon and Koyukuk rivers. They were fed the meat and fish available locally. Around 1960, some experimentation with different hounds occurred, trying Saluki, Foxhound, and English Pointers. These dogs created some hybrid vigor that for speed and enthusiasm was hard to match. These dogs, however, didn't deal with the elements quite as well. So now the teams are made up of the pure old breed Huskies and the Husky Hound Crosses. A good definition for a sled dog is a dog that runs fast, pulls hard, and loves to do it. 16 dogs. 16. At the checkpoint, everyone goes through the same procedure. Straight ahead, they'll take you up to the red wand, blinking red wand, waving. How many dogs? 16? 16. 16. All right. Martin Boozer. Martin Boozer. Martin Boozer. Each musher has his own special supplies flown ahead to every checkpoint. The dogs catch their breath. And then there's that unique recipe for dinner to get cooking. 
At each checkpoint, the mushers can get straw to bed their dogs down on. The mushers are carrying all the gear they need for the safety and the comfort of the dogs and themselves, such as dog jackets for when it gets cold, first aid kit, and battery-powered headlamp. Plus, the mandatory gear required by the rules, sleeping bag, axe, snowshoes, promotional materials such as mail, booties for the dog's feet, a cooker to melt snow, and a veterinary notebook. The heat's right at the end of the food line. Okay. And the heat is also. Yeah. And then we have hot water out there this year. Hot water in this one. Hot water is available at some of the checkpoints. It's very important to keep the canine athletes hydrated. If there isn't hot water available, the mushers have to melt snow to make water for the dogs to drink, and that takes a lot of time. In the early stages of the race, it can be very confusing for both the spectators and the mushers as to who is really in the lead. The musher who is first into the checkpoint is not always in the best position. The teams that are traveling the fastest down the trail with the strongest dogs are often best situated. Also, many of the mushers are not stopping at the checkpoints, but stopping to rest the dogs along the trail. And that makes it doubly confusing. As Martin Boozer leaves Squentna, he's facing a very rough trail. The leadership in the 27th edition of the Iditarod includes the familiar names of the pre-race favorites. Martin Boozer, Jeff King, who are joined by John Barron, Linwood Fiedler, and Ramey Smith. Remember, the clock is always ticking. Finger Lake Checkpoint, 8.45 a.m., full moon, and very quiet. From here, in Squentna, it's 75 miles to the place known as Rainy Pass. The mushers travel through forests of spruce along creeks and lakes, where water overflows can complicate your life. Some of the descents, just before Rainy Pass itself, are considered to be the most dangerous on the entire trail. Footsteps in the snow take on a distinct sound at temperatures like minus 20. Martin Boozer checks in with his team at a pace that says he's in a hurry. A quick whistle, and the dogs respond. This has been Squentna's big day in the Iditarod, but now the activity is quieting as the race leaves this checkpoint behind. Still, not all the beds of straw are empty, and as much as these dogs like to be heard and to mush, they love to eat. Really fast run. I've just been breaking it up so they're really short runs. Dan Dent, the Baltimore investment counselor, has had better days. He knew his dogs had to be a team in every way, and sometimes there are internal locker room spats. Unfortunately, he used his bare hands to break it up, and they've been badly cut. At the checkpoint, the race judge is concerned. blood. Poor Yentno just got over into some soft stuff and uh, had to uh, G him back onto the trail and got a little tangled up, and uh, one of the dogs got really tangled up. And got into a real nasty, uh, vicious uh, dog fight, which the team's never done before. So it's pretty disappointing. I got my hands pretty well shredded up. A rookie mistake, and the next day, for the safety of everyone, race officials withdraw Dan Dent from the Iditarod. So I don't know what's going on inside these gloves. Yeah. But uh, if you want to look at it, the bright side of it, uh, um, no, one, no one will be able to tell me I didn't save that dog's life. The Iditarod is so glorious to finish because it's so difficult to do. At Finger Lake, the Iditarod once again reveals its growing international side. First it was women, then a guy from Montana. Now it's Norway that the Alaskans have to deal with, with race rookie Harold Thunheim. He's in the checkpoint with a fast time and immediately goes to put the gang to bed. Native Alaskan Joe Garney is also there, taking care of himself.
The dogs come first, even in Norway. Harold Tunheim's dogs have been recognized by everyone. They're huge, 60 to 80 pounds, and part Greenlander. Meanwhile, Doug Swingley comes through with his thoroughbred team. He's been saying this is the best dog team he's ever had. It's a competition. Not my favorite part of the year, but it's the time that I get to get together with all of my fellow competitors, who some of them, like me, have raised these dogs from the day their eyes opened and could see you and, and cared about them to compete against all the other dogs. So it's like uh, putting your kids in t-ball or in softball and finally now they get to play in the big leagues. That's the Iditarod. This part of the Iditarod Trail includes what are called the Happy River Switchbacks, notoriously known for being narrow and filled with gaping holes that can swallow up your sled. This year, the conditions aren't as tough, making Happy River live up to its name. The dogs are obviously incredibly fit, but the musher has to be really fit too. Many people would think that running up the hills behind the dogs is the hardest part for the musher, but it's actually controlling the heavy sled and slowing the team down, going downhill. This is public land, however, and there is the potential for someone going the wrong way using something not in the spirit of the race. He is not very happy, and the musher must act quickly. After a few frantic moments, Linda Pletner's team is on her way. But the crash has damaged the trail. And for the others to follow, like D.D. Jonro, it's something else to deal with. Okay. For D.D., after 17 Iditarods, that's little more than a pothole, and she handles it with ease. It's high noon and minus 20 degrees at Shirley Lake. Ramey Smith needs a break. It's his fourth Iditarod and his best ever 15th place finish tell you he knows what he's doing. Susan Butcher says he's an up and comer. Here he's in good company because his next door neighbor is Martin Boozer. 20 years ago, he moved to Alaska from Switzerland to do this. So he's very much at home sleeping inside his purple cocoon. Ahead at Rainy Pass checkpoint, there is a reluctant leader who is telling everybody he wishes someone else would show up because he doesn't like all the attention. 57-year-old Charlie Bolding has four top 10 finishes in six Iditarod tries, and he knows the first thing you do is the dog thing. And that is what veterinarians from all over the world come here to do, take care of the dogs. parameters are concerned it's based on the hall concept h-a-w hydration heart rate aptitude at appetite attitude and uh, weight or body weight so um, do the skin fold test see how well the skin snaps back that gives us good hydration hydration that's beautiful and look at the mucous membranes the gums kind of feel if they're tacky push on a little bit, the, uh, the color should, uh, when you blanch it out by pushing in, the color should come right back. I uh, like to listen to the heart rate and the lungs. And then I like to feel for the body weight. 
fat reserve along the back and the pelvic area. Beautiful. It's real nice. We like to see the team come into the checkpoint. If any dogs are limping or showing any uh, abnormal gaits, we like to do an orthopedic exam on those dogs. Uh, usually what we do in those cases is check for any soreness in the joints, flexion of the wrist, and uh, flexion of the shoulder, both legs. We squeeze the wrist, go back on the shoulder. We might take a quick peek at the feet, see if there's anything there. Just kind of work our way back. Just kind of run our hands down the Achilles tendon area of the back. But that's one of the reasons I stress to my veterinarians, I like them to watch the teams come in the checkpoint because they can see the dogs moving and learn a lot to, about any orthopedic conditions just from observing the, uh, the, the gait of the dogs when they arrive. The Norwegian Harold Thunheim arrives to polite applause at Rainy Pass. The media is starting to scramble for their media guides. Welcome to Rainy Pass. Hello. Doug Swingley was there too, giving his dogs water in the form the temperature demanded. Is that your snack in the winter? It's just ice. Swingley's dogs enjoying their Iditarod popsicles, and they look to be in excellent shape, and that makes the head coach of the team pleased. 200 miles down, over 900 to go. A lot can change. Where do the Alaskan Huskies get this love to travel and to pull? It's theorized that because they are descended from the wolves, their desire to travel comes from their instinct to hunt. So the dogs are always ready to run. Dee Dee Jonro does her part to stay with the leaders by approaching the checkpoint shortly after at Rainy Pass. Though cold, the weather has been very cooperative. Martin has dropped two dogs at Rainy Pass for strained shoulder muscles. Many other mushers have also dropped dogs. Dogs may be dropped at any checkpoint if they are tired or sore or for strategic reasons. These dogs are immediately taken into veterinary care until they are flown to Anchorage where they are picked up by the mushers awaiting families. Martin's 14 dog team, still moving strong, heads to the desolate outpost called Rome. Eerie shadows mark Martin Boozer's arrival in Rome. Population, zero. It's simply a roadhouse that dates back to the 30s when dog teams like these carried the mail along the Iditarod Trail. It's minus 35 degrees. And the dogs look ready to lie down. Boozer is quick to make their beds. The faster he does that, the faster he can pamper himself with some Ziploc bags filled with some of his favorite foods. Jeff King locks down the sled to prevent any midnight wandering. Each dog eats up to 12,000 calories a day. That's like 40 Big Macs, so it takes a lot of cooking. The food high in carbohydrates and protein will be mixed with a lot of hot water. A musher has to also be a chef. There must be time for a little bonding, and King makes some, as the activity at Rhone begins to pick up. The next major destination is Nikolai, the first native village along the trail. It's 131 miles between Rainy Pass and there, 
and this is the heart of the Alaskan range, so there are sharp hills and steep grades. Barren areas feature wind-packed ice, plus this is buffalo country. A night vision camera provides a look into the oddity of all the leaders being in one small roan cabin. Few words are spoken. Sleep is necessary but tough to come by. They get one or two hours a day. The smell of hot soup fills the air, while the five-time champion Rick Swenson looks and is exhausted. This early in the race, the sleep deprivation creates a feeling like very bad jet lag. That's correct. He departs at 0431 with 16 dogs. And finally, bib 18 arriving today's date, 0507 with 14 dogs. Rick Swenson feels this is a time to move. Perhaps he's seen the mountaintops and the clouds. The weather is changing, but that's behind them. The wind is vicious, 50 miles per hour, making the wind chill something you don't even want to calculate because you don't want to know. Inupiaq Eskimo Russell Lane and Max Hall of Manchester, England in red are being hit hard. From opposite ends of the world, they are placed by Iditarod fate behind one another, hitting the frozen summit of Rainy Pass. The trail markers signal they are still headed right, and where they are headed is to a part of this world that makes you feel so small. Volunteers of the Iditarod Air Force continue to make deliveries at Rome. Some nests have been left behind. Many are still filled as the field thins out. Russell Lane, hunter, whaler, Eskimo dancer, proud of his heritage and culture and to be in this race. One minute in 1991, Max Hall was a tourist in Alaska. The next, he was bitten by the mushing bug. Just finishing this is something else that joins these two. That plus the fact that their bodies are screaming. There you go, dude. Thank you, boy. I'll be feeling some pain, but we'll have to keep going no matter what. I've worked hard for this. Yeah, uh, I'm tired. But uh, I'll figure something out. Russell Lane's resting is over for now. He wants to show his children he can do this. It's a powerful want. Thank you. There's a lot going on where little usually does. Roan, population zero. Everybody's transient.
17 hours ahead, Rick Swenson's with Martin Boozer. It was a nice sunny day. I figured why not stop here where it's nice and quiet. Martin was here. A little good company in a nice quiet spot. And just go from here right to McGrath. Yeah, she's got a sore foot. Sore leg. I don't know what it is. So she'll probably get a ride in the sled. So Blondie. Yeah, let's see. Got in store for me today, huh? There you go. Rick Swenson shakes his head. He knows Blondie. Everybody does. Martin Boozer's lead dog, if he loses her totally, would be a major loss. In the neighborhood is Charlie Bolding. He's camping out because he likes Swenson and Boozer's style. This is a St. Martin Swenson park back there, and I got to thinking about it. And I, I, I figured out what they're going to do. The smartest thing to do. They'll sit, sit here to cool off and then take off all the way to McGrath. Pretty smart move. So I decided to get in on it. All good, ideas. All good ideas don't have to be your own, do they? I was born and raised and lived in the same county for 36 years, north in Rockham County, North Carolina, which is in the foothills of Blue Ridge Mountain. I went out west, so I bought some sled dogs. And uh, a couple years after that, I got really into the dogs and enjoy running dogs. So I said, well, if I'm gonna run dogs, I might as well go to where, it, where you can really run dogs. I pretty much came to Alaska just looking for some wide open space. If I had an overall strategy, it's to, to disrupt any, the other competitor's game as much as I can uh, by what I do. In other words, um, I'd like to, I, I'd rather have them reacting, reacting to me than me having to react to them. Weren't they cute? <laughs> Life in the bush is, is different. It's not for everybody. There's not much money in it. It's a good life for us. My grandmother doesn't like for me to race dogs. First time she seen a picture of me with ice on my beard, she said she cried all night. She thought, <laughs> she said I looked like a corpse. So uh, I told her, I said, well, Grandma, the only way I can come home is, is uh, when I win a race, I can afford to come home. She said, she thought about it a while, and then she said, well, I reckon it might be okay if you race one more time. <laughs> For the native village of Nikolai, it's one more time that the Iditarod excites everyone by its arrival. Some say 125 people live here, but there's a sign in town that says 40 less. Maybe there's been a population explosion. There are many children here, but minus 34 degrees, keeps most of them inside. Hunting and fishing is how you live here, and it's a rugged way of life. Still, they love the Iditarod, and the populace is being told it's coming. Martin Boozer arrives with urgency once again. Three more dogs have sprains and strains and must be left behind. His MVP and lead dog Blondie is one of them. And she looks crushed to be taken out of the game. Mainly her left front. Who 
Loser wastes little time. Down to 10 dogs, he'll need every second. And leaving Nikolai, he must have been thinking of his favorite dog. In 1990, I had to drop Grant at my three-time Iditarod champion lead dog. My remaining young leader surely felt off balance without Granite's dominant force. However, I had to look forward and have faith in the dogs I had remaining. I won that race. With Martin's skill and determination and Blondie's spirit still with the team, he has a good chance to win. If there was win, place, and show wagering on the 27th Iditarod, and the race ended right now, the payout would be low. The favorites filled the top spots in the standings. Boozer, Seavey, Balding, Swingley, and D.D. Genre. Swingley's the only non-Alaskan in the group. From the native village of Nikolai, the mushers travel 48 miles to visit the 500 people who live in McGrath. 23 more where the 51 people await into Katna, onto Ophir, and Iditarod, two ghost towns where nobody lives. The lure of gold is history. Approaching Iditarod is 95 champion Doug Swingley, who's doing exactly what he did to win that year. He has kept going, while all the other heavy hitters except Martin Boozer have camped out at Tukatna for their mandatory 24-hour rest. Swingley will have to take his as well, and everyone wonders when. Plus, it's been learned Swingley may have broken a rib, certainly bruised them, on the race's first day. Could the pain slow him down? or maybe even shut him down? Boozer knows that trying to keep up is his only shot to find out. And so on the tundra, nearing the halfway mark of the most important thing in his life, he tries to keep Doug Swingley in sight. He'll need a telescope. Swingley is almost two hours ahead. On the icy bank of the Tukatna River is Tukatna Village itself. It has a store, a restaurant, a bar, a satellite dish, and a big welcome for the mushers. After all, many spend that 24-hour mandatory rest day right here. Sonny King arrives in Tukatna, and even though the vets will check his dogs, he's a veterinarian himself back in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Sonny says author Jack London and his call of the wild is one reason he's in the Iditarod. Another is being selected as one of the race's veterinarians back in 1993. This year, he's decided to be a player, organized his effort, his dogs, and his bumper stickers. One of my friends gave me an Alaskan Malamute in about 78. Obviously, I started reading about Arctic breed dogs, and you start reading about Arctic breed dogs, and you start read, reading about sled dog sports. That leads you to the Iditarod. And now Three, I started making plans to find out what it was about. You know, exactly what, what, what makes those dogs want to go from Anchorage to Nome, 1150 miles across the most <laughs> desolate wilderness you can imagine. And, you know, is that because is that somebody's making them do it or is that because they, they want to do it? So I went up there the, the first year as a, as a volunteer veterinarian, one of, one of 22, and to see what it was about. And within, oh, just within almost hours of being around my first team there at the, the pre-race vet check, you could see the care and the concern and the fellowship that the mushers have with their dogs. You gonna spend some time with us? Oh yeah. You gonna do your 24? Yep. We're gonna take, we're gonna take a little break. So Sonny and his team are going to be like that old red pickup truck, not going anywhere for a while. Dee Dee Jonro assesses her chances. Our chances are good. You know, they're eating and they're drinking well. They are carrying good weight. They're happy. Um, and there's a long ways to go. We're not even halfway. And so, you know, I think that's the, to me, that's the point. And everybody takes their 24 if they're smart. What's most advantage to their particular team? And this team, although I had originally planned to go to um, Ofer, is better uh, better suited to stop now. I think another two and a half hours last night would have made them not feel so good. And as it was, within an hour, they ate five gallons of food. So, you know, I believe I got a lot in them because they felt really good. They weren't really tired. They are a young team. They'll rebound fast if you don't. 
you know, push them a little too much. Yeah. Trotter pitched a little temper tantrum when we left McGrath. So I thought, you know, Trotter and I are just working out this relationship here, and he, he and I seem to be getting along really well. He's going to think I am nobody worth listening to if we blow two checkpoints at once. And, and you know, like the other guys know, but I need Trotter to, to be with me too. I need this to be a, a team effort, a gang. <laughs> and one of the gang leaders here needs to uh, realize that, you know, I truly do have his best interest at heart. And I think this really was a confidence builder for him. The mushers keep busy feeding and fixing during the day. And the planes keep coming and going to the delight of the young Tocotnans. Susan Butcher with Jeff King. It's so early to tell, but is there anybody that you feel is your toughest competition at this point? Oh, uh... Martin being down on dogs, he's walking a pretty fine line. I suspect he, yeah, I'm sure you can win the race with 10 dogs, but they better be the right 10 and you can't afford any mistakes and Lady Luck better be shining on him. Uh, it would appear that uh, Doug's team's in excellent condition. Um, they look real happy when I saw him here and uh, he's quite, quite proud of them. And, uh, but he's, he's got some pretty serious pain in his chest from a fall he took at the start too and uh, I know that he's uh, hanging on with some pretty major effort uh, he's he was really sore but uh, I think he's got a great dog team I think uh, Rick Swenson's dog team looked real good uh, and Baker's is smooth he's down a couple um, boy it's tough I, I think the most exciting thing is uh, seeing Harold from Norway a beautiful dog team he's very calm and collected and really in tune with his dogs and uh, when I saw him out in the burn uh, he caught me there and watching the spirit of that team um, really made me wonder if in fact it wasn't possible that a rookie could win this race. Well I think last year I was like a rookie I was back out here like a rookie I'd kind of gotten two years off of the trail you know but um, honestly I feel better right now after 14 hours in my 24 hour break than I felt all winter. I think probably partly because, you know, by here, either your dog team is falling apart or coming together. And I think mine's coming together really, really nicely. I might be, you know, I might not have the speed to catch those guys. My strategy might not work, but I have faith in it. And as long as there's two of them out there busting heads, then it's more likely to work than if there was only one of them. My motto is that most of these guys now they want to run to the river and walk to Nome and my motto is walk to the river and run to Nome so we're going to see if it works. The long 24 hour wait is over for Dee Dee Junro. Trotter and the rest of her 12 dog team is itching to get going. They have fresh booties on and are well rested. Some last second schmoozing and Dee Dee Junro's 17th Iditarod begins again. Is there a first win out there for her on the trail? Harold Tunheim, the Norwegian rookie, has been noticed by the veterans, and he has some supporters speaking the language from home to send him on his way. One thing is clear, the strategies have been put into motion in the Iditarod, and Doug Swingley's already cashing in. So on behalf of the employees, the management, shareholders of GCI, Congratulate you. Of gold nuggets. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. In the Iditarod, Doug Swingley's ribs are pounding with pain, but he's popping a painkiller, and he says it's working. Martin Boozer's ten dogs still have him up there, with Rick Swenson, Dee Dee Jonro, and Harold Tunheim. Don's cabin is 64 miles from Iditarod. The falling snow here has covered the trail. While once again, the dogs of Dee Dee Jonro are confused. Lead dogs Trotter and Commander maybe smell Jeff King's dogs and want to bed down for a while. But that's not Jonro's plan. With a little push from King, they are back on track. I needed to stop and give meds. Say this about Dee Dee, she's got an upbeat attitude.
After 74 miles of mushing since the 24-hour break, Dee Dee gives the team a rest and herself something to eat. She's in the middle of nowhere, and it's everywhere she wants to be. Rick Swenson is in the same snowfall and has also called timeout. The spirit of the Iditarod is to keep things as they used to be, but change in everything is inevitable. And around this game for over 20 years, Rick has seen a lot of it. All those old guys had a lot more, you know, stories. Most of them had built the sleds they were driving and maybe sewed the harnesses they were using. And had a lot of, you know, they'd been out trapping all winter and stuff, and it was kind of a get-together, you know? I mean, not Good all, old boys club. The good old boys club, that's kind of illegal to have a good old boys club now, you know? Yeah. Anywhere north of the Mason-Dixon line, anyway. <laughs> but, Admittedly, anyway. Oh, there was some gals, too, you know? I mean, that, it was just, but it was, you know, it was just different. There was always stories about hunting and trapping and talking about sleds and stuff, you know, heck, now you don't even have time. I never even took my boots off from Anchorage all the way to Tecotna. You don't even have time to change your socks. Well, you're talking when you, 77 was 20, 20 days, wasn't it? 20 days 18 wasn't days or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was, you know, we went through, uh, it was the first time we went through Rainy Pass and there was storms and, you know, it was, yeah, now down to nine days. I mean, you don't well, have any time for you. Well, we didn't have booties. We had to tape the booties on with adhesive tape. And we didn't have helpful. quick change runners. And you, I didn't even carry a stove till 1981. I just, if I wanted to feed my dog, I stopped and built a fire. If I, if I was going to go farther than, if I was going to go someplace where I didn't think there was going to be wood, I'd stop and cut a couple trees down, throw them on top of the sled. <laughs> you know. So I know that was the option. I wasn't going to carry a Coleman stove. It was too heavy. Were the changes good or are the changes bad? Oh, I think most of them are good. You know, it's just for as much money as we spend and as much time as we spend getting ready for this damn race, it should take longer than nine days. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us enjoy being out here. If it took 15 days, I wouldn't mind, you know. Doug Swingley's had one of those bad things happen, the kind the rest of the field might have been hoping for. His sled is broken, and a replacement that was broken earlier is being flown in. I've had a terrible time. I think the dogs need a new musher. <laughs> but, yeah, this is my second sled I've busted. I'm sitting here now waiting for, a, for another sled to come in, the one that I just dropped, which is broken. And uh, in the, right in the beginning, I uh, cracked or, or bruised a rib. So it, it hasn't been the most fun for me. It's good the dogs are doing so well because that makes it better. It's not as painful. There is some controversy about the sled request, but it is ruled to be within what is legal, and the Iridium satellite phone calls are made to get things in motion. The only problem is getting the plane to dart in through the snow. Some have been grounded. You broke a second sled. Okay, yeah, we can get help and get an air taxi to get the other one in there. The other one that's in the cargo. Yeah, that's no Finally, the sled makes it in. By now, Martin Boozer is also on the scene and delights in the Christmas morning-like reaction of the man he's battling. Yeah, now you can see Swingley smiling again before he was crying. I took this one for Nome. I took this one to Nome before I know it'll make it. I'm smiling again like a little baby, like a little kid. Look at even my daughter happy. He's got a new, he's got a new toy. Even my daughter happy. Martin Boozer thinks about this family and the one back home. You know, when you think about the kids, you'd like to go home and see them. And, um, you know, my hardship happened between Nikolai and Rowan, so you think of the two boys named Nikolai <laughs> and Rowan all the time. And I felt like quitting a lot of times, you know, and, and probably get some more ups and downs like that. But then they helped me an awful lot because, I, you know, I tried to set a good example, and quitting is certainly not, not one of the options that, that's really high at the surface right now. 
you just keep on going. The mushers way back into Katna are in a different world, the one where just getting to Nome is the mission. Russell Lane, the Inupiaq Eskimo. When times get rough, I just tell myself, man, I'm going whaling. <laughs> Every, every step these dogs take is a step closer to home. Susan Butcher with Max Hall. How's the race going for you this year? You're 24 in here. Oh, I've had my moments. I busted the sled runner into two miles before the, the steps. I repaired it in Rainy Pass with hose clamps and some bits of steel. Pretty good repair that got me down the gorge OK. Got to Roan where I'd telephoned my wife from Rainy Pass at one o'clock in the morning and asked her to have me a Tim White toboggan six-foot model delivered to Rome by three o'clock in the afternoon on the next day. So I thought, great, I've got a new sled. Set off across the ice, got onto the dry land on the other side and promptly broke my sled runner again. These are the dogs of Vern Halter. He's an attorney and kennel owner in Willow, Alaska. This is his 11th Iditarod, and he's had four top tens. But right now, he's 27th, so it's time to get going. Rick Swenson arrives in Iditarod, as Doug Swingley, after his 24-hour rest, prepares to be the first one to leave. Martin Boozer will follow, but not before hearing a little Swenson gamesmanship. How is it? Huh? You'll find out. I know I will. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't any problem for my dog. Pretty good, actually. They like it. Knowing Swingley is getting set to depart has them scrambling to fire up the snowmobiles that break the trail and make it possible to move on. Doug Swingley is putting pressure on everybody. The Montanan speaks the language his dogs understand, and at 1 a.m. he leaves Iditarod. Swenson, needing rest, waits two and a half hours before resuming the chase in the 27th Iditarod. Doug Swingley, the man from Montana, the first non-Alaskan to win the Iditarod, is still the leader. Martin Boozer's depleted team is still second. Five-time champ Rick Swenson knows the chase is on, and Dee Dee Jonro is in the mix. Moving on from the halfway mark, Iditarod to Grayling is a 108-mile run. Shagaluk is Indian for village of the dog people, so the race moving through there fits. Anvik marks a turn onto the bitter cold Yukon River. The winds here are legendary and sometimes devastating. There are many aspects of the race that determine where the mushers will be in the standings by the halfway point. Where and when and for how long they will rest their dogs. Where to take their 24-hour rest stop and how fast they will allow their team to travel along the trail. The speed can be controlled by the musher with the brake. In a race like this year, when the trail has been particularly rough, it is each musher's guess whether to make up time by running fast and hard and risk injury, or slow down and protect the dogs but lose valuable time. After the Iditarod checkpoint, each musher will be letting their team go as fast as they can the race is on to know which strategy has given the musher the strongest, fastest team. At this point, we can ask, did Martin go too fast? Is that why he had to drop so many dogs? Are Vern Halter and John Baker holding back too far? How is Doug traveling so fast with no injuries to his dogs? Only the finish line will tell. Everybody is having a Doug Swingley problem. For Boozer, it's the fact that over the last 90 miles, Swingley's been 18 minutes faster. That's the kind of speed that can break your spirit if you let it. Boozer's not the type. Even so, as he arrives, Swingley's already inside the cabin, being given the feast that is the tradition of the first musher to the Yukon. As well as the seven-course meal, Doug Swingley also wins $3,500 in cash from the Regal Alaskan Hotel. Better than my cooking. 
Jeff King is not being treated nearly as good by himself. As Rick Swenson arrives in Anvik with Didi two seconds behind, they trail Swingley by two hours, but only 30 minutes behind Martin Boozer. Rick's dogs look great, and equally as important, Rick looks like he knows his own mind and his own strategy. Yep, 31, number 31. I want to roll. I don't want to these guys to think they're going to stop here. You don't want your... Uh... I don't want nothing. Okay. However, Dee Dee seems a little nervous. She appears to want to keep Rick Swenson and his dog team in her sights. Okay, ready? Oh, oh, oh. Even the way she talks to her dog team sounds tentative. On, Doug Swingley is ahead in Grayling, the last village for 130 miles. His thoroughbreds have done him well so far and aren't even breathing heavy. He's confident and moving out. Thank you, Edna. Thank you. Can hey. I give this to Susan to hold? Yeah. 90 minutes later, Martin Boozer enjoys the crowd, then checks the dogs, and then feeds them the usual concoction. His pace is easy, in spite of Rick Swenson's roar from behind. Boozer also has to deal with another problem. One of his runners needs replacing, but it doesn't seem to phase him, and he does it with pit crew speed. D.D. Jonro and Rick Swenson arrive in Grayling in a virtual tie. Water. Yeah, but I mean, I can't have the dogs to get out of the you took your 24. Yeah. Can we find that? Yeah. I want to drop a dog. I want to dance. Some of the other kids need new shoes, and they get them. That works pretty good, a piece of copper pipe. Swenson leaves on this clear, starry night with the temperatures down to minus 40. It's going to be a long night on the Yukon River. For both of them, John Rowe keeps right with Swenson as they leave the same way they arrived. Maybe together, they can speed up the pace. All of Charlie Boulding's long gray hair is tucked neatly inside his parka, as neatly as his ability to stay involved in the race. The wind is picking up, 75 degrees below zero with the wind chill. Disaster hits D.D. Jonro. In the middle of the night, her lead dog, Commander, decided he had had enough of this race and stopped, something he'd done before. Um, Commander and Joe. But no. Well, and Trotter. It started with Commander. Hold it. And you know, it you, started last year across Gullivan Bay. And I saw the crack, you know, and I told you. And I saw it in the Copper Basin, and I thought I had repaired it. I was chaining them around, you know, and he'd get away. Trotter did pretty good for a while, but everybody cracked, you know. I'm the even, Commander was the beginning. backwards. Commander was the beginning. Yeah, I can't, I can't, I mean, they won't go. Yeah, I know, I understand. I understand. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay, well, we will. It is. <laughs> DD General's Iditarod is over. On the Yukon River, Doug Swingley's lead continues to be large. Over Martin Boozer, Rick Swenson, and Jeff King, Vern Halter's moved up 22 places to fifth with some very fast running times. The journey from Grayling to Unalakleet is all about surviving the 20 mile per hour headwinds and minus 35 degree temperatures along the icy mass of the Yukon River. Eagle Island means you're halfway through it. Unalakleet means the Bering Sea, an entirely different set of problems. This race has been defined by Doug Swingley's speed and his push to Iditarod. It was now a simple game for Rick Swenson and the rest. Find something extra while you're surrounded by some of the most vicious conditions Alaska can throw in your face. Doug Swingley arrives in Unalakleet with a lead over two hours, leaving everybody behind him just trying to hold together. He flashes the smile of achievement with just over 200 miles to go. At 882 people, it's the largest village between the start and Nome, and most have come out to catch a glimpse of the man who's living out something their ancestors would respect. For here in Unalakleet, they have a respect for the battle with nature to live their lives. They do it every day on the brink of the Bering Sea. It is life with little luxury and lots of hard work. These days, most of their equipment lies in the snow in the middle of another quiet winter. The Iditarod once again provides a pleasant distraction for the proud and the young of Una Laclete. And they have a gift for Doug Swingley. Uh, since 1993, National Bank of Alaska has sponsored the Gold Coast Award in recognition of that. And so uh, this year I'd like to present you uh, with the 1999 Gold Coast Award. Uh, in addition to the trophy, we also have $2,500 worth of gold nuggets uh, straight from the gold fields in, in Nome. And uh, if you don't mind, we'll hold on to that for you sure. until the end of the race. Yeah, I'd lose. And uh, so congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Meanwhile, in Swingley's wake, more misfortune. He had danced in front of a storm that Rick Swenson and Jeff King hit head on. We were both standing out there in this howling snow storm, and it was like, you know, I don't think we can get across here. I mean, and there was, you know, it wasn't like, oh, you know, you're a wimp or anything like that. I mean, it was like we both were like, this is real. It's, I mean, it just, we've been fighting the weather ever since Don's cabin, and it just isn't in our cards this year to not have it, to have it work. So. Whether I am fifth or 15th, I, I'm really not going to get that excited about it. I want to get there uh, so that when I do, my kids will know that I practice what I preach. Um, having my daughters just have some trouble at the state gymnastics meet and something they could always do in practice didn't work out in the meet. And uh, I know they know that I can do this in practice. And I've done it, but you don't do it every time. And uh, 
there's no way I'm going to win this race. I've uh, certainly long ago conceded this to Doug unless that weather that seems to be avoiding him like the plague finally <laughs> decides to bottle him down. Oh, I'm still hoping that Doug will get stuck somewhere. <laughs> Good, Good God, I'm not uh, giving up yet. So one seems resigned, the other does not. But this does seem to be Doug Swingley's Iditarod to lose. Draped in a beautiful sunset, he leaves Unalakleet to try and handle the last few surprises of the Iditarod. In years past, the storms off the Bering Sea have been rough surprises indeed. Swingley confident heading to Nome. King resigned to not winning. Swenson still committed to the cause. While Martin Boozer, down to nine dogs, is still because of his skill a part of what's to come. If the desolation of the Bering Sea coast doesn't intimidate you, then nothing will. And it provides the backdrop for the final Iditarod push to Nome. The mushers will visit Shaktulik and get hit with more wind. And after extremely isolated villages like Koyuk and Golovan, an appropriately named checkpoint called Safety is only 22 miles from the finish. Martin Boozer wasn't quitting, but Swingley was a ridiculous nine hours in front. Rick Swenson is trying to hang on to third place. He believed Swingley had gotten lucky with the weather, and he was right. Just behind Swenson is Charlie Bolding, his beard laced with ice, and the battle for the paydays behind Swingley was getting tighter, as Vern Halter had charged from 17th at Iditarod to now fifth. Mike Williams is a 45-year-old Yupik Eskimo, and like many Alaskan natives who know about their problems with alcohol, he races to remind the kids what you can do when you're sober. He hopes the message hits home in places like Shektul. At this moment, Canada's Hans Gott and Mike Williams have a different concern for a fellow racer. The South Carolina veterinarian, Sonny King, left the last checkpoint before them. They didn't pass him, and Sonny's not in Shaktuli. Recognizing how easy it is for anyone to get in trouble in these conditions, they ask race officials to search for Sonny, and they do so by air. We understand that there's two other mushers that came in before him, and uh, so, and they had to see no sign of him at all, and uh, they had part of after him, so yeah, we just want to make sure he's doing okay. He might be just camped out in the tray a little bit, and, Take a little break, but we want to make sure. The pilot spots Sonny King, and all it is was a wrong turn. Sometimes when things aren't going exactly right, you know, I, you look up and I'll see an airplane going by, and I think, you know, this is not a half bad way to travel either. But uh, yeah, it doesn't last long. Just a few few moments when you're feeling sort of sorry for yourself for doing something real dumb. But mostly, it's been a it's been a it's been a great trip so far, and I always look forward to getting to the coast. It's one of my favorite areas. Sonny gets his wish. He has reached the coast, and can see a lot of it. Vern Halter, the lawyer from Willow, Alaska, approaches the checkpoint at Elam, population 281. If he finishes top four. It will be his best Iditarod in 11 tries. What lies ahead for him and everyone else is 46 miles of this. Elam to White Mountain. White, windswept, nothingness. White Mountain, 77 miles from Nome. Here, Doug Swingley's dogs are doing something Martin Boozer's won't do for over seven hours. Now, even the most ardent competitors agree, Doug Swingley is to be the winner of the Iditarod. Here, the hot stoves burn for most of the year, and a church once again is the proud centerpiece of town. Little is heard, except one of life's greatest sounds.
Doug Swingley adds what should be a final new runner for what has been a dominant race. Here's Susan Butcher. This trail was really tough. Everybody had to slow their teams down, that that's the only reason they could be able to keep their numbers. And yet, everybody pointed their fingers to you and said, Doug didn't slow him down. Why didn't you get the injuries? Why wasn't that a problem? Because I've been a maniac all year. I've been letting these dogs do whatever they want to do. I mean, it's I've broken like five sleds. This isn't the first sled bang and crash and stuff I've done. I decided early on in training that I wanted to have a dog team that could all run together in any kind of condition. So I just... I mean, I was in training going 20 miles an hour down the hills and letting them just rock and roll, and nobody fell out of training. And I think they all got used to just hanging in there, and I got to pick dogs that all hung in there at that pace. So I think that was really significant. No, I didn't really stand on the brake and slow them down. I just let them. Okay. Talk to me about the red and black cap. <laughs> We're used to seeing it on Martin. Is there any significance here? This cap was a Christmas present to me from Dr. Sonny King, a friend of mine, and Martin's. And I guess he figured that maybe I needed a change in luck, so I needed to change my image. And, and I thought about it because in 1995, I switched clothing sponsors to Northern Outfitters, which incidentally was Martin's, and I won in 95. And now I've switched to a hat that's the same color as his, and I've won. So I'm going to have to check you know, his underwear and whatever else he's wearing for following years so that I can continue on but I don't want to be a copycat Joe Runyon said this is a Montana cowboy winter cowboy cap and Martin just happens to have one just like <laughs> next stop Front Street in Nome the final miles to Nome for Doug Swingley are a triumphant march. The final few obstacles proving to be nothing much. And when one is so much stronger than the rest, the battle for the next places is a noble one. Of course, there's also the money. Each musher forms a training strategy prior to the start of fall conditioning, hoping that theirs will be the winning formula. Some running short, some with heavy loads, some steady and tough. Doug always went on trips of 140 miles, transporting his dogs away from home, and therefore always running towards home, towards a goal. But all training techniques aside, the team that wins is the one with the strongest and fastest dogs and the best canine leaders. Gnome is the musher's goal. However, it's the journey that we go out there for. During the Iditarod race, the musher and the dogs almost become one. There is no other time of year like it. The dogs are our kids, friends, and teammates combined. So although reaching Gnome means friends, family, and rest, there's a sadness that the bond between you and your dogs will be intruded on by the celebration of a job well done. It is 1.30 in the morning, and nine days, 14 hours, and 31 minutes after he started the 27th Iditarod, as Doug Swingley reaches Nome. At 45, he is the oldest man to ever win. He didn't beat his record time of four years ago, but this one was a masterstroke of boldness, good fortune, and great dogs who looked great, all things considered. Dogs don't celebrate, but they know when they've done well. They just do. You could write volumes about the hours, the days, and the months that Doug Swingley committed to this moment. But the bottom line was, he made the right choice. Stormy and Cola and Elmer were part of the team. For Elmer, it's a first ever Golden Harness Award as the top dog in the Iditarod. Doug, tell us about the three dogs that you've got up here. Elmer won with you last time, but this may be his year to retire. 
Yeah, well, he's now uh, just turned eight years old, and this is his sixth Iditarod, his fifth completion. So he's been over it enough times to where I think he's maybe deserved his gold watch. But he he's still a dynamic dog. You know, I mean, he's, but he's, the most important thing is that this is Stormy, his daughter, and this is uh, Cola, his granddaughter. So literally, virtually every dog on the team is either a, a, a grand pup or a, or a daughter or son of Elmer. So he's been the, the mainstay of my dog team. I refused almost the whole way unless I really needed him to put him in the situation where he had to lead. So uh, just for, for his benefit and for mine as well, because I, I don't want to have a big lapse going between lead dogs. So this little girl right here is just going to follow in his footsteps. So there's no, no reason to have him put in that position. I'd like to present to you the check for winning the 1999 Good the Rod for $54,000. At least $54,000. And on behalf of the Anchorage Dodge Dealers and Anchorage Chrysler Dodge, I'd like to present you this 1999 Dodge quad cab pickup truck. It's one of our most popular pickup trucks. It's four-wheel drive and it'll show you many, many good miles in the state of Alaska. And thank you, and hey, you're a fantastic winner. Congratulations again. Well, I certainly used the last one I got, and I, it needed to be replaced, so this, this, is a welcome, this is a welcome sight. When you run a race like this, and you're down to nine and 10 dogs, and really having to push yourself, what do you think this is teaching the boys? Well, you know, you ask the Boozer Boys, what stops the Boozer Boys? And they'll look you straight in the eye and they say, nothing. And I try to instill that, that perseverance, that drive to, to make them realize that when you dig a little deeper, you can go a little harder and a little farther. And the whole race through, I didn't want to call anybody at home because I felt like if I would just get a little telephonic hug or a tap on the on the back, you know, I might be out of here. So I never even I never talked to anybody in the family at all because I I was looking for a little solace, you know. I was looking for yeah, you're doing all right. You can come home now, you know. But ultimately, you got to just see it through. Vern Halter roared up to finish third. So Rick was ahead of me for the whole race. The first time I saw him was Eagle Island. And then up to Keltag, old woman, Uniclete, just trying to get a half hour, anything I could. And then we, then Rick went from Shaktuik to Elam nonstop, and I just followed him. And then, of course, got caught in the heat resting, so I just cut my rest by an hour and followed him out. Then the pass was made. So it was worked out to my advantage. And that was a long run from Shaktuik to Elam. Rick Swenson crossed the line in Nome in fourth. It's just a matter of as long as you enjoy it in a race like this. I mean, even as frustrating as it was potentially. I mean, I never really even felt frustrated when I was breaking trail and stuff. It was just like, it was a challenge for the dogs. Charlie Balding hung with the big boys the entire race and finished with them too in fifth. Harold Tunheim of Norway was rookie of the year, finishing 19th. And Sonny King, the Spartanburg, South Carolina veterinarian, finished an impressive 22nd. Eskimo Mike Williams finished 23rd and thanked his Delta dogs for the ride. Thank you for my ride dinner. Russell Lane had support from Point Hope and thanked them by finishing 31st. Oh boy, good to be here. I'm tired. Max Hall of Manchester, England was noted as the most improved musher, and he finished 37th. With nine mushers not finishing, here are all the finishers in the 1999 Iditarod. Well, way up in Alaska, the state that stands alone, there's a dog race run from Anchorage in the Nome. And it's a grueling race with a lightning pace with the chilly winds do well. Beneath the northern lights cross snow and the ice that's called the Iditarod Trail. We'll give me a team and a good lead dog and a sled that's built so fine. And let me race those miles to Nome 1049. Then when I get back to my home, hey, I can tell my tale. I did, I did, I did, yeah, I did a ride trail. 
Then when I get back to my home, hey, I can tell my tale. I did, I did, I did, yeah, I did the right trail. To the people of the Iditarod, the last great race honored. Now available on home video, the 1999 Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. Here's your chance to own an exclusive VHS copy of this special event and relive every moment from this year's show. Follow the winners through all the group competitions to the awarding of the prestigious Best in Show. It's all here on the 1999 Westminster Kennel Club Home Video, featuring host David Fry. Top dog in the country last year, all breeds, import from Italy. Legendary broadcaster Joe Garagiola. Crowd give him a big hand. And good for you, Pico. I'm glad to see that. And the voice of Westminster, Roger Karras. Gentlemen, may we have the group winners into the ring, please. Here they are, the best of the best. Four amazing hours of coverage are yours for only $29.95 plus shipping and handling. Not available in stores. To order, call toll-free 1-888-550-DOGS. That's 1-888-550-DOGS. Order your copy now.